This is just a continuation of the derivative rules that we've been doing. We did the constant rule, power rule, things like that. Now we want to continue with that and do rules for products and quotients. I'm just going to jump right in because like I said, it's just a continuation of what we were doing last time. So how do you take the derivative of product? If you want to take the derivative of two functions taken as a product of each other, in other words, multiply together, the derivative rule is not just take the derivative of each separately and multiply them together. That's not the product rule. Unfortunately, it's a little more complicated. The product rule says if you want to take the derivative of the product of two functions, f and g, you take f and multiply it by the derivative of g. Then you take the reverse of that, you take g and multiply it by the derivative of f, and then you add those two products. A little more complex than you might have thought, but not overly so. If that way of writing it looks a little cluttered, I might suggest a slight alternative that maybe looks a little cleaner. Instead of using f of x and g of x, I'll just say u and v, where u is like the f of x and v is like the g of x. And if you think of it that way, it's uv prime, that's the derivative of the product, is u times v prime, that's u times the derivative of v, plus, and then you reverse it, v times u prime. How you can best remember this formula is the way you should do it, but the alternate way of thinking about it maybe is a little cleaner than the original. And again, I just want to jump right into working problems because all we're doing is introducing these new rules and you need to know how to use them and get started practicing them yourself. Suppose I ask you to find the derivative of the function f of x equal the quantity 1 over x plus 1 multiplied by the quantity x minus 1. That's a product. The product rule says to multiply them together, but I would suggest one thing. In our earlier work, we saw that sometimes it was nice to write these simple rational expressions like 1 over a power of x as a negative exponent and work with it that way. And I would suggest doing that here. So I would suggest writing 1 over x as x to the minus 1 before we even start thinking about the derivative. But now that it's done, we can think of that as a product. The first factor is like the u, that's the x, x to the minus 1 plus 1. The second factor, the x minus 1 is like the v. And the product rule says you take u v prime and then v u prime and add them together. I wrote it out symbolically. u is the x to the minus 1 plus 1. Then the derivative of the v, I wrote it out symbolically, plus, then you take v, which is x minus 1, times the derivative of the u, which is x to the mi minus 1 plus 1. Now, I wrote it symbolically, so I've got to go in now and take the derivative of each of the things that I wrote symbolically. So in the next step, I'll note that the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1, because the derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of minus 1 is 0. Then I want to take the derivative of x to the minus 1 plus 1, I note the power rule tells me what to do. Remember that x to the minus 1 is like 1 x to the minus 1. And the power rule says you can take the exponent times the coefficient, so that's minus 1 times 1, and that just gives you minus 1. And instead of writing minus 1, I just wrote minus in front. But if you want to write minus 1, you can. I actually prefer just to write the minus sign. But if you do write minus 1, no harm done. But then you decrease the exponent by 1. And so that minus 1 becomes a minus 2 when you decrease it by 1. Now it's a matter of multiplying things out. Obviously, when you multiply something by 1, you just get that thing. So that'll be simple enough. Over here, you've got to distribute. So you want to take the minus x to the minus 2, and you want to multiply it by the x. And remember, that's like x to the 1. And when you multiply with like bases, you have to add the exponents. Now, I don't want to turn this back into an algebra course, and this is something you need to deal with on your own if you're very weak with that. 
So to multiply out this last part, you're going to multiply each term by the minus x to the minus 2. So that'll give you x times minus x to the minus 2. And I just wrote a, the x with the one exponent just to emphasize that there really is a 1 up there, even though it's just understood. And then you've got minus 1 times minus x to the minus 2. And I just went ahead and took advantage of the fact that I know that a negative times a negative is going to be positive. So I just went ahead and made that positive. Be very careful about your signs. Now you want to notice that when you multiply with like bases, you add the exponents. And also notice here that you've got a positive x and a negative x to the minus 2. So you're going to get a positive times a negative. That'll be a negative product. So the first part is just carried along. But to simplify inside, this minus x to the minus 2 that gets multiplied by x, if you multiply the positive times the negative, you'll get the negative, like I said. But when, you, but when you have like bases and you're multiplying, you add the exponents. You add 1 and negative 2, and that comes out to be negative 1. If you're having trouble with this, go back and refresh yourself because we, we don't have the luxury of reteaching algebra, but you do have to know this stuff or you're going to struggle. And then the last part, you're going to multiply the minus x to the minus 2 times minus 1, and a minus times a minus is plus, and otherwise a 1 times an x to the minus 2 is just x to the minus 2. So make sure you can reproduce that. And continuing, you'll notice you've got an x to the minus 1, but then you've got a minus x to the minus 1. When you add those together, you get a 0, so they just add away. And all you're left with is 1 plus x to the minus 2. WebAssign is perfectly happy with that answer. If you want to write x to the minus 2 as 1 over x squared and write the answer as 1 plus 1 over x squared, that's okay too. You have to practice this because there are places where there are common mistakes, especially with signs, and getting confused with the negative exponents. So practice makes perfect. I'll also say but there are lots of times when you could use the product rule when perhaps it might be better not to. We saw some problems earlier on where you had a constant times a function, and we did it by the general power, what I call the general power rule. You could have used the product rule on that had you had it at the time, but it's probably not the best way to do it. It just is, it takes longer, it's a little more work. I want to show you an example or two of that. In fact, I picked out an example where there's a slight difference in what I would consider the ease of doing it, but not a whole lot where you could reasonably choose one of two different ways. What if you had a problem like this? If you had y equals the quantity 2x times the quantity x squared plus 3x, that is a product. You could use the product rule straight away and get the right answer. For example, if you did that, you would have, if you thought of the 2x is the u and the x squared plus 3x is the v, that would be the u and that would be the v. Simple derivatives, then you can multiply everything out and you'd see the 4x squared and the 2x squared are like terms and the 6x and the 6x are like terms and you would end up with 6x squared plus 12x. Fairly simple, but what if you decided to multiply out first? Sometimes multiplying out would be hard or maybe even practically impossible. Here it wouldn't. You could just multiply through by the 2x and you would get 2x cubed plus 6x squared. And if you took the derivative by the power rule for each term, you'd get 6x squared plus 12x, which is exactly the same thing. Personally, I think the second method is quite a bit simpler, but not extraordinarily so. You could reasonably do it either way even though I lean toward method two. So when you look at a problem, before you just jump, think for a second if maybe there's a way you could simplify the original problem before you jump into the derivative. If so, it could save you from making an arithmetic or algebra mistake and getting the problem wrong. How about a quotient? We talked about products, now we want to introduce a rule for quotients. If you thought the product rule was a little complex, what do you see the quotient rule? 
the quotient rule will allow us to expand what we can differentiate. We could do any polynomial using the rules we had earlier, even before the product rule. Now we want to add some, a rule that allows us to do any rational function, and that's a quotient is a ratio, is a rational expression. And the quotient rule, as I said, is more complicated. It simply says that if you want to take the derivative of a fraction, if you think of f of x as the numerator, d of, g of x as the denominator, you get a fraction for the result. The numerator of the fraction is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, that's g times f prime, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, which is f times g prime, and then that's all in the numerator, and on the bottom in the denominator you square g and that minus sign means it's crucial that you get the products in the right order up top and of course this only works when the denominator is not equal to zero so obviously when you're dividing by zero that formula wouldn't apply I will say that students often have trouble remembering this one in particular Here's something that might help. It's sort of a way of remembering it that, that by the way you write it, it helps you remember it. There are other ways, and if you've heard of other ways, and there's way, other ways that work for you, that's perfectly fine. But here's one way that I found that helps students get it right. And that is this. D over dx, that's d dx, that's the derivative, symbol for derivative, the derivative of high over low. What's high? High is the numerator because the numerator is higher than the denominator. What is low? Low is the denominator. So the derivative of high over low, that's the derivative of a fraction, numerator over denominator. The derivative of high over low is low times the derivative of high minus high times the derivative of low over low squared. But if you say it the right way, I think it's a lot easier to remember. I say it to myself something like this. The derivative of high over low is low d high minus high d low over low low. That's sort of easy to remember once you say it a few times. Where d high means the derivative of high and d low means the derivative of low and low low means low squared. So it's up to you if you want to say, well, it's silly, I never do it that way, that's fine. But if you, th if you think about it, anything that helps you remember it is an advantage, especially when you're stressed out sitting down to a test. You don't want to have to Think about whether I remember it correctly. So if you want to remember low D high minus high D low over low low, go for it. Let's jump right into some examples. If I gave you a function whose derivative is going to require the quotient rule because you have a quotient, then you want to do, again, I recommend thinking of it high over low, and you do low D high that's the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus high d low. That's numerator times the derivative of the denominator over low low, which is the denominator squared. However you remember it. Those individual derivatives in the numerator are, are easy to do. I'm not going to belabor them on the video, but if you're having trouble, you need to get some assistance and not just sweep it under the rug. And then if you multiply everything out in the numerator, you're going to foil out the first term and you're going to multiply through by minus 3 on the next term and if you simplify that and be very careful with the signs you will get that expression in the numerator which has common terms so you've got x's that can be combined you've got x squared that can be combined and you've got numbers that can be combined and when you done, you'll get in the numerator negative 6x squared plus 8x plus 1. In the denominator it was the 2 plus 3x quantity squared. We haven't done anything with that. And there you go. WebAssign will like that answer and you're good. Let's ask another question about that. What if I want to take this problem further? What if I said now that you found the derivative Find the equation of the tangent line at a particular point on that curve, and I chose 1 comma minus 1. Well, remember, that takes you back to algebra. When you're actually 
thinking about equations of lines, you learned how to do that in algebra, and you need a point and a slope to find the equation of a line. Well, you've just been given a point, and you just calculated the slope. That's the slope of the tangent at a generic value of x. So all you have to do is, is use that information to write the equation of the line. The first thing I want to do is figure out what the slope is at the point 1 minus 1. This is the slope at some generic value of, of uh, x, but what is it at exactly x equal 1? Well, that's easy. Just take it and plug 1 in. If you plug 1 in for x, you know, here, here, and here, and do the simplification, you actually end up with 3. So what you figure out is the slope of that line at the point 1 minus 1 is 3. Well, now you have a slope and you have a point. You can go back to your algebra and the point-slope form and get the equation of the line. So first of all, you have to remember the point-slope form is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1 where m is the slope and x1, y1 is the point. x sub 1 is the x coordinate of the point and y sub 1 is the y coordinate of the point. So you plug them in. So x is 1, so x sub 1 is 1. y sub 1 is minus 1 and m is 3. Plug those in. Minus or minus is plus. And if you multiply 3 by 3 on the right, you get 3x minus 3. Then if you subtract 1 from both sides, you'll get the equation of the tangent line. So that is the equation of the tangent line to this original curve at the point 1 comma minus 1. You have to get used to the flow of these things. If you want to find the equation of a line, you need a point and a slope. Finding the slope is a calculus problem in general. And the rest of it is just algebra from algebra 1 and algebra 2. A little bit of advice to not every quotient needs to be differentiated using the quotient rule. It could be that if you could rewrite things, you might be able to do the problem in a much simpler way. Often you can't, but when you can, you've saved yourself quite a bit of work most of the time. Let's do a couple of examples of that. If I gave you the function y is equal to x squared plus 3x quantity over 6, that could be done as a quotient work rule where f of x is x squared plus 3x and g of x is 6, but it would be much easier to say, well, instead of dividing by 6, I want to multiply by 1 6. In other words, dividing by 6 is the same as multiplying by 1 6. And if we do it that way, you can use your rule that says the derivative of a constant times a function is just the constant times the derivative of the function. So the 1 6 travels along and then you take the derivative of x squared and get 2x and the derivative of 3x and get 3 and then multiply through by 1 6. You could also multiply th through by 1 6 before you started taking the derivative. If you wanted to do that you'd get y equal 1 6 x squared plus 3 6 x, well 3 6 is 1 half, so you get 1 half x. And then if you did it that way, that's a 1 6, you could go directly to the derivative over here by using the, the power rule on each term. So in either, either case, you're not using the quotient rule. The worst way to do this problem would be, the, be by the quotient rule. It would be the, by far the longest way you could possibly choose to do it although it could be done. How about this one? 5x to the fourth over 8. Well again, we've talked about this before, but you have to get used to, to being able to manipulate these things in ways that make your life easier. We talked about this in class actually, that having something in the numerator of a fraction is equivalent to having it out front because really putting it out front, that x to the fourth is like x to the fourth over one and when you, when you think about it, you do top times top, bottom times bottom, you're back to where you started. So get used to being able to push things into the form that makes them easier to differentiate. But once you do that, you're just using the, the general power rule again. So you take the coefficient the 5 eighths and multiply it by the power which is 4 and then you reduce the 4 down by 1 and make it a 3. 
And so now you've got 4, which is 4 over 1. And if you want to multiply, you get 20 over 8. Or you can reduce divide, by dividing the 4 into 8 and get a 2. In any case, when you finish the process, you'll end up with 5 halves x cubed. And again, you could do it by thinking of it as being 20 eighths, which reduces to 5 halves. Or you can um, divide the 4 into the 8, which leaves a 2. Either way, practice makes perfect on this stuff. One more. If you have 9 over the quantity 5x squared, again, it would be easier to push the, the variable out front, but since it's in the denominator, you have to push it in the numerator, which may, means the exponent changes sign. So that, that x squared in the denominator becomes an x to the minus 2 in the numerator, which, as we just discussed, can also be put out front. So you end up with 9 fifths times x to the minus 2, now you just got to multiply the 9 fifths times the exponent, which was negative 2, and then reduce the power of the minus 2 by 1 and make it minus 3. And you end up, if you think of the minus 2 as minus 2 over 1, you end up with minus 18 fifths x to the minus 3, which would simplify to minus 18 over 5x cubed. And I will actually show that simplification just for your benefit. You could write it as minus 18 over 5 times x to the minus 3. And actually, I will say, WebAssign's perfectly happy with that answer. If you want to give that as your final answer, WebAssign doesn't mind. But you could also drop the x to the minus 3 back into the denominator and make it an x to the positive 3, and that's what they did. But WebAssign is perfectly happy with that circle answer right there. So you need to practice and see what web assign will take and what it won't take and what is best for you in terms of leaving your final answer in a form that you're comfortable with and that web assign will accept. Let's throw in a couple of more problems before we wrap it up. In this problem it says, as blood, as blood moves from the heart through the major arteries out to the capillaries and back through the veins, the systolic blood pressure continuously drops. Consider a person whose systolic blood pressure, capital P, in millimeters of mercury is given by this rational function. P is equal to this fraction whose numerator is 25 T squared plus 125 and whose denominator is T squared plus 1. And it's valid in the range from 0 to 10, in other words, from 0 seconds to 10 seconds. And the question is, at what rate is the blood pressure changing 5 seconds after the blood leaves the heart? When they talk about a rate of change, you know it's going to be a derivative. So without even giving it much other thought, you probably want to go ahead and take the derivative of that rational function, and that's a quotient rule. That's your low d high minus high d low over low low. And again, other than being careful, it's not hard to, to multiply things out and collect like terms, and you end up with dp over dt as being the negative of 200t over the quantity t squared plus 1 squared. Now as for the change after 5 seconds, so you let t equal 5, plug in 5 into this expression here, and you end up with, after all the arithmetic's done, rounded to the nearest hundredth, negative 1.48 millimeters of mercury per second. There are several types of, of what you might call word problems that can be done in this section. This is an example. You'll have others, but they all, ha they all have the same thing in common. You start out with a function. You're doing a rate of change in something, which means you do the derivative, and then generally you're going to do it at a particular point, so you'll plug in a number. So that's sort of the commonality between all the type of quote-unquote word problems you might have here. Let's end up with one more. This problem says find the point or points, if any, at which the graph of the function has a horizontal tangent line, and this is y is equal to the fraction x squared over x minus 9. So horizontal tangent line means slope of 0. That means you want to find when the slope is 0. Well, the slope is given by the derivatives. That tells you you have to take the derivative, and if you want the derivative to be 0, that means once you find the derivative, you'll set it equal to 0. 
And then it's just a matter of solving for x to figure out the points you're looking for. Point or points. So the first thing we're going to do is take the derivative. Well, that's a quotient, so you'll do low d high minus high d low over low low. Then you'll multiply out and simplify, collecting like terms. And then you want to set that derivative equal to zero. Well, it's a fraction, so if you want to solve for x, you probably want to clear out the fraction by multiplying both sides by the denominator. Notice that when you multiply the left-hand side by the denominator, it cancels out, which is the reason you did it, by the way. And that just leaves you with x squared minus 18x equals zero. You might also get there quicker by just noticing the only way you can make a fraction zero is for its numerator to be zero. But either way, you get the same result. And x squared minus 18x is factorable. You can factor an x out, and you'll get x times the quantity x minus 18 is equal to zero. That gives you two factors, zero and 18. The problem says find the point or points. Well, that, those aren't points. Those are just x values. So what you want to do is, is realize that you've just found the x values for two different points, but you haven't given the whole points yet. You have to find the y values to get the point. Well, how do you get the y values? That involves going back to the original function and plugging in the x values. So I want to go here and plug in 0. I'll go back to the original function, plug in 0, and you get 0. So that gives me a zero here. I plugged in zero. I calculated y and got zero. Now I do the same thing for the 18. I plug 18 in to the original function, and I end up, when I simplify, getting 36. So once I found out that x was 18, I can figure out that y is 36. So to answer the question, the point or points, there happen to be two, so there are points, at which the graph of the function has a vertical tangent line are the points 0, 0 and 18, 36. You need to practice this a lot. Practice it to understand when you read the problem what they're asking you to do, and then even more so maybe practice doing it, because doing it, especially with product and quotient rules, is typically multi-step, and each step gives you chances to make careless mistakes. So practice, practice, practice.